They say there's a million stories in the city. I say there's only three. Some Joe looks at another Joe the wrong way. A poor slob doesn't watch where he's going and the bus flattens him. And then there's a sorry bastard that can't get out of his own head. Maybe there's a million variations, but these are the three stories. You can decide which this is. It was raining that morning and cold. The kind of cold that freezes the places in your coffee won't dare touch, but bourbon actively seeks out. She breezed into the office miraculously dry, smelling of roses and something else. Something forbidden and irresistible. Flaming red hair framed an angel's face, but her eyes, her eyes were black as oubliettes. She asked me if I was a private eye, and I told her that's what I had painted on the door. I knew who she was. Her widower father had been a wealthy railroad magnate who died a couple of years back, leaving his fortune to his surviving heirs, a son and twin daughters. The twins were identical, indistinguishable, but for one feature. This one had a small birthmark under her left eye. Her sister didn't. This one said her name was Stella. She said she thought her brother was trying to kill her. He was a drunk too, and a gambler, and he'd blown through his inheritance. Her sister's husband had been found dead a week before with his throat cut. Now her sister was missing. Stella was afraid she was next. She said she didn't know what to do. What to do? What do I do? She asked me. I don't know what to do. I said, I'm not a therapist, dollface. I'm a dick. I'll find your sister. She said her brother's name was Raymond and her sister's name was Laura. She agreed to my fee, 25 bucks a day plus expenses. Then she looked at me hard with those beautiful, horrible black eyes and left the room. Letting all the oxygen back in. I fortified myself with another belt and went out into the cold, out into the rain, out into the blinding gray. I went to work. My first stop was the morgue. The coroner was a pal of mine, but only because I traded cash for information. Here's what I bought. Someone had slipped behind Laura's husband and sliced his throat ear to ear as he worked in his study. There were signs of forced entry through a parlor at the other end of the mansion. No weapon was found, no other clues. The killer wasn't taking any chances. I also found Laura. She'd been brought in a few hours earlier. Her body had been discovered the night before behind the pool house on her estate grounds. The left side of her face had been smashed in. A blood-soaked shovel was found a few feet away. The murderer knew how to clean up after himself. There were no prints, nothing to point to another presence but for Laura. Laura's face was unrecognizable. Her hair wasn't. It was matted and dirty, but still you could see sunsets in it. I'd seen that hair before. It was time for me to interrogate someone who was still alive. Raymond was surprisingly easy to find, or maybe not so surprising since he wasn't hiding. I found him at the address Stella gave me, an anonymous room in a flea bag hotel. I knocked. That he answered the door was surprising, he could hardly stand. The stench of stale booze made me dizzy and thirsty. I braced him. He had no fight left. His self-pity was a marvel to behold. He didn't know about the death of his sister and her husband. He'd spent the last few weeks drinking himself to death. The smell and the empty bottles corroborated his testimony. He had no money. What was left of his family had written him off. He had nothing and no one. He asked me if I believed in God. I'm not a priest, I told him. I'm a dick. I left him to get on with it. I went to see Stella to see if I'd missed anything, and to bring her up to speed. She'd want to know about her sister. She might want to know about her brother, or maybe not. She knew where he was. Stella lived alone in the penthouse apartment she'd inherited from her father. It sprawled 14 stories above one of the most exclusive addresses of the Upper East Side. She opened the door herself, wearing a dress that looked like it was made out of starlight. We moved into the living room. It was dominated by a fireplace around which was displayed a variety of antique rifles. 
Her father had been a collector and lovingly kept them all in working order. She'd been informed about Laura's husband. The local PD had interviewed her a few days prior. She knew he'd been murdered. She knew the killer was still at large. But at the news of her sister's death, her black eyes widened. The whites seemed to disappear. Tears formed, but did not run. She fell into my arms. I could feel her breath hot against my chest. I hadn't had a drink for hours, but I felt drunk again and had to steady myself from falling backwards. She did not sob, but pressed her face tight against me. I pushed her back softly and looked at her. Those eyes so black, those lips like ripe strawberries, her skin so white. I looked down. There was a black smear on my gray coat. Laura, I said. Her hand shot up to where the birthmark used to be. You killed your husband and your sister. Your sad wreck of a brother's on his way to finishing himself. All you have to do now is wait and you get it all. Is that right? In a flash, her face was contorted by a demonic rage and just as quickly changed back. If you blinked, you missed it. I didn't blink. She pointed to the brandy on the bar and told me to fix us a drink so we could talk. I've never needed one so badly. I did it without thinking. I poured two stiff shots and turned back to her. She was standing in front of the window that overlooked the street below. She'd taken down one of the rifles and was pointing it at me. I told her she didn't want to do that. She said her father loved those guns and taught her how to handle them. She'd kept them all ready and loaded. A single girl in the cold city can't be too prepared. She'd even fired most of them. And yes, she very much wanted to do this. What's one less drunk in the world? I looked at the drinks in each of my hands and wondered the same thing. She raised the rifle and took aim slowly, lovely. She pulled the trigger. She'd fired most of the guns on that wall, but not this one. This one kicked, this one kicked hard. I heard the bullet whiz past my right ear. The recoil lifted her off her feet and through the window. My hands opened involuntarily. The glass seemed to shatter on the marble floor at the same time her body hit the ground 14 floors below. I went to the window and looked out. Her beautiful red hair continued to spread out across the sidewalk. Even from that height, I could see her eyes wide and black staring back at me. I've heard say that God watches over children and drunks. I wouldn't know about that. After all, I'm not a philosopher. <laughs>